Shalom, uh, greetings from Jerusalem. Uh, delighted to be back, uh, even at a distance, uh, with uh, my friends from Poland and to be part of my favorite Jewish culture festival anywhere, anytime. And uh, thank you, Janosz Makoc, for all that you do, for your friendship, for really this just gift of uh, Jewish culture that, that you have been presenting now for, for 30 years. So what I would like to discuss with you all today is the view from Jerusalem, the experience of Corona here in Israel, how it has affected us socially, politically, uh, perhaps spiritually, uh, what we might expect from the Middle East the morning after Corona, and where we might be heading. And I'll, I'll begin with a general observation about this experience for humanity. I sense that when we wake up into the world the morning after Corona, we're going to discover a world that is deeply schizophrenic. On the one hand, the experience of national borders, of each country withdrawing into itself to cope with Corona, will leave a memory, a legacy of strong and, and revitalized nationalism. This, a this is, of course, a trend that is happening in many places around the world. It's happening very strongly uh, in Poland and in Israel and elsewhere. And I sense that the, the experience that we all had, which was to deal with corona by going into a place almost of siege from other countries. The first impulse of countries was to shut their borders. Even countries in Western Europe that, uh, that have uh, been, been promoting this vision of a post-border Europe, uh, their first impulse as well was to close the borders even against each other. And so one legacy will be a, a reaffirmation of the necessity of nationalism, uh, which I think is a positive. The negative of that is how far do we take nationalism? When does nationalism become xenophobia? When does nationalism become authoritarianism? And we're seeing those trends, of course, happening around the world. And so that's one legacy I believe that we will all be dealing with. Uh, in the morning after Corona. But the second legacy, and this is really where the schizophrenia comes in, is that we will all have had what I believe is the most universal human experience in, in the history of humanity. Thanks to social media, all of us have gone through the same emotional trajectory of anxiety and fear of mortality at the same time. All of us have been aware of how corona is affecting different countries, even behind our, our walls and borders. We all knew the numbers are going down in China and they're going up in New York City and they're stable in, uh, in Korea. We, we were all part of humanity's first trans-border experience of oneness. And my strong feeling is that that memory is going to remain imprinted in human consciousness. It will reinforce our sense of belonging to one shared humanity, one shared human space, and somehow, in the morning after Corona, we are going to have to navigate the contradictions between a newly uh, reaffirming nationalism, uh, a, a reinvigorated nationalism on the one hand, and on the other hand, a very powerful experience and memory of universalism. And 
so on that note, uh, I'd like to take the talk into a more uh, Israeli direction. I'd like to focus the lens now, narrow the lens onto Israel. And note that Israel, at least in our first stages of dealing with corona, uh, dealt with the emergency reasonably successfully. Uh, for those of you who may know Israelis or know Israeli society, you'll appreciate when I say that Israelis are an anarchic people. We're a people that uh, avoids discipline, that's very suspicious of discipline. Uh, every Israeli is, is a prime minister. And yet, when Israelis are convinced that we're dealing with a life and death situation, we have a capacity to make an instant switch from anarchy to discipline. And we saw that happening from the early stages of corona. As soon as the Israeli public became convinced that this was serious, we, we fell back into a, a pattern of discipline. We listened to instructions by and large, and the results were positive. Uh, we also had a leadership that knows how to communicate uh, via media, that knows how to speak to the Israeli public. And I'm thinking, for example, of uh, the United States, who did not have an effective leadership to communicate coherent and consistent messages to the public. And in, in that sense, in Israel, we benefited at this moment from the fact that we are a society that has lived under one form or another of siege and existential threat from the very beginning of our existence. And so we are a society that knows how to make the abrupt transition from uh, normal daily life to a state of emergency. And that helped us cope very effectively with corona. Uh, as I'm speaking to you now, we seem to be heading into the next phase. Uh, the, the restrictions uh, were drastically reduced. We have more or less returned to normal life here. Uh, many fear prematurely because the corona numbers are now rising again uh, quite, uh, quite strongly. And so what may be the second wave, or at least the first and a half wave uh, of what we're dealing with now uh, means that uh, we are not yet out of, uh, of danger and it is premature to celebrate an Israeli success in, uh, in overcoming the corona threat. Uh, what is not premature is to celebrate a great social achievement that we've experienced here as a result of Corona, and that is bringing the Arab-Israeli minority closer into the Israeli mainstream. Israeli society is about 80% Jewish and 20% Arab. And just to further complicate the picture, we are speaking about Palestinians who are citizens of Israel. 20% of Israel's citizens are Palestinians. I'm not speaking about the Palestinians uh, in the West Bank and Gaza. These are citizens of the state of Israel. And as you can imagine, holding an identity that is at once Palestinian and Israeli, uh, this is a very conflicted community, a community that has not found its place easily within the Jewish state, a community that is often regarded by Jews as, a, as potentially disloyal, <coughs> excuse me, even though the, um, the community has proven its basic loyalty to the state over and over again. This is the first time during Corona that the Israeli media, for example, has treated Arab Israelis not as a problem, not as a political problem, but as fellow citizens 
who are dealing together with the Jewish majority uh, in confronting a national problem. Now bear in mind that Corona is the first national emergency that this country has faced, the first life and death crisis that has nothing to do with security, nothing to do with the Arab-Israeli conflict. And so this is our first civil emergency. And as a result of that, a space was created that allowed Arab Israelis to take their place in the mainstream as fellow citizens, unequivocally, without the Arab Israeli conflict hanging over us, without the question, the complicated issues of identity. Are you Palestinian? Are you Israeli? Are you both? What does that mean? This was simply a moment when Arab citizens of Israel and Jewish citizens of Israel could come together. Now, if there was any crisis, any civil crisis that would have been best suited to help bring Arab Israelis into the mainstream, it would be a healthcare crisis for a very simple reason. Our healthcare system is the most integrated between Arabs and Jews of any segment of Israeli society. Over 20% of Israeli doctors are Arab. Over 25% of Israeli nurses are Arab. And close to 60% of Israeli pharmacists are Arabs. And so this was really the moment when the Arab-Israeli community could, could present its Israeli civic credentials in a way that would be seen and appreciated by their fellow uh, Israeli Jewish citizens. And there were very moving images, photographs that were circulating on social media that really caught this moment of Arab-Jewish cooperation. For example, uh, a beautiful photograph of an Arab doctor bringing a Torah scroll into a corona ward. Uh, there was a photograph of a medic team, an Arab and a Jew, praying together on a street before their parked ambulance. And the Jew is wearing a prayer shawl, and the Arab is praying next to him on the street, prostrate on a prayer rug. That image went viral. In fact, if I had to define one image that sums up the Israeli experience of Corona, it would be the Arab and the Jew praying together before an ambulance on a street corner in Israel. And so the legacy of, of Corona for Israeli society is potentially healing of our deepest social rift. Now, deep problems remain. Just last week, uh, Israeli police shot and killed a young uh, Palestinian man here in, uh, in East Jerusalem, whom they mistook for a terrorist. He was, he was autistic. They had ordered him to stop. They thought he had a gun. He didn't understand the orders, and he was shot and killed. In uh, what many here uh, are saying, certainly on the Palestinian side, uh, was an example of police uh, overreaction. Uh, it is something that needs to be investigated. But those kinds of incidents, which are built in to the tensions that we live with here every day, inevitably impact negatively on the ability of Arab Israelis to trust the system, to feel fully a part of Israeli society. But at the same time, a poll was taken recently asking Arab Israelis whether they see their future connected to the future of the state of Israel. And 77% answered affirmatively. Only 11% of those polls identified as Palestinian. And those were the lowest numbers that I've ever seen. I've been tracking these polls for years. I've never seen such, such low numbers, such, such overwhelming affirmation of the Israeli identity of, uh, of our Arab citizens.
And so this is a hopeful moment and the legacy that Corona leaves uh, in this respect uh, really is, uh, is potentially Let me say a word about this political moment in Israel. Those of you who may have been following even cursorily uh, the political developments here in Israel know that we have gone through a very difficult, tumultuous, chaotic uh, political year. In the last year, we have had no less than three consecutive national elections because each election resulted in a stalemate. Uh, neither, neither the right-wing bloc nor the centrist bloc uh, was able to put together a gun. And after round three, we still found ourselves in a stalemate. And at the same time, we're experiencing the pandemic. So there's a convergence of crises going on in Israel. The thought of Israelis going for a fourth round of elections, which may very well have also resulted in a stalemate, throwing the system into complete disarray, a democratic country that cannot create a government, a situation we've never been in, and I don't know of other countries that have been in this situation. That happening together with the pandemic really put us in, a, in, in, in an unprecedented crisis. Now factor in one more crisis, which is over the last few months, Israel has been experiencing its worst crisis of democratic legitimacy since the 1990s and the period around the assassination of Israeli Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin. What has happened in the last months is that the Israeli right has essentially taken the gloves off and declared war against the legitimacy of our democratic institutions. Our Prime Minister, Benjamin Netanyahu, uh, who is currently on trial on three counts of corruption, has counterattacked against the judicial system by attempting to delegitimize the judges, the courts, the rule of law, claiming that he's the victim of a left-wing plot by the police, by the court system, uh, by everyone. And uh, bear in mind that it's Netanyahu who appointed the chief of police, who appointed the attorney general, and somehow these people are all conspiring to, uh, to unseat him. And there is this paranoia uh, and cynicism that is deeply destructive uh, and undermining the credibility of, uh, of the rule of law for, for many Israelis. The last round of elections, which resulted again in a stalemate, created a situation where the head of the opposition, Benny Gantz, the head of the blue and white centrist party, attempted to negotiate with the with the third largest party in the Knesset, the United Arab List, representing 15 out of 120 Knesset seats. And Benny Gantz tried to create a joint coalition with the Arab List, the first time that any Jewish party tried to create a coalition with an Arab party. And it failed, and the truth is it probably had very little chance of succeeding, uh, for many reasons, one of which is that the Jewish majority does not trust the Arab party, some of whose Knesset members, members of parliament, uh, have supported terrorism, Palestinian terrorism against Jews. Um, the United Arab List opposes any Israeli military action against, against any provocation. And so there's, there's really no basis for creating a shared government. But the very fact that Benny Gantz tried to explore whether it would be, whether it would be possible to create a joint Jewish-Arab government for the first time in Israel's history uh, broke a, a taboo 
and was a very hopeful moment, which also, by the way, contributed to the process of bringing Arab Israelis closer to the main. Netanyahu's reaction to Benny Gantz's attempt to create a Jewish majority Arab minority government was to declare that he actually won the election. Yes, it's true, he said, that he didn't win a majority of Israeli votes, but he won a majority of Jewish votes. And therefore, he is the legitimate prime minister. Now, I always assumed as an Israeli citizen that an Israeli election is determined by Israelis. 80% of Israelis are Jewish, yes, but 20% are Arab. Now, my prime minister was now telling me that the rules of the game had changed. Suddenly, the Arab votes were just a mere technicality and really had no significance. If a majority of Jews want Netanyahu as prime minister, then he should be prime minister. This, to my mind, was the single greatest threat to Israeli democracy in our 72-year history. And so all of these threats, corona, the stalemate in the political system, Netanyahu's assault on our democratic institutions, Netanyahu's undermining of the philosophical basis for democracy, which is every citizen has an equal vote. All of these crises coming together created an unprecedented and really untenable moment for Israel. And so Benny Gantz, the head of the centrist Blue and White Party, took a step that for me as a supporter of the Blue and White Party, uh, and for many others who voted for Blue and White, was extremely painful, I would even say traumatic, but necessary. And that is Gantz decided to form a government, a national unity government, together with Netanyahu. Now, what made this especially traumatic was that Gantz had run a campaign for the last year and a half that was based on only one promise. I will never sit with that guy. I will never sit in a, in a government with a prime minister who is on trial for corruption. And yet here was Benny Gantz reneging on a year and a half of campaign promises and forming a government with Netanyahu. As a result of that, his own party, Blue and White, split into two. One part went with him into government. The other part stayed in opposition. Uh, Benny Gantz's numbers in the polls have gone way down since the formation of this government. No one in Israel likes this government, and that's not an exaggeration. This is Israel's most unloved government. Centrist voters didn't want this government, not in the worst way. And Netanyahu supporters did not want the government with Netanyahu's most bitter critics. And yet we realized as a society that it's one of those moments where we have no choice. And I think that this tells us something essential about how Israeli politics works and how Israeli society works. And that is that at moments of truth, at existential moments, we know how to pull back from the abyss and how to come together. And this, I think, is a crucial component of Israel's ability to survive and thrive in a region that has never accepted our legitimacy, that has declared war against our existence from the day we were founded. And this is really what has allowed us to, to meet our challenges in, in ultimately a, a successful way. I'll say a word or two about um, our relations with uh, the Palestinians, with the region, and uh, with that, I'll, uh, I'll conclude. Uh, as I'm speaking to you, uh, in, um, it's now uh, um, mid-June, 
And the big issue on the Israeli agenda is the future of Netanyahu's plan to annex parts of the West Bank. And it's not clear yet what Netanyahu is hoping to annex. It's not clear yet whether annexation will go through. Netanyahu does seem to be determined uh, to push through annexation. My hope as a uh, person of the center rather than the right uh, is that uh, the blue and white party will do everything it can to thwart Netanyahu's plan of annexation. For me, the prospect of, of annexation goes to the heart of Israel's moral credibility. For 53 years, since the 1967 Six-Day War, Israel has been telling the Palestinians, we've been telling the Middle East, we've been telling the world, that in principle, we are ready to negotiate the future of the territories. Even as we have built settlements in the territories, we have still insisted that that doesn't foreclose the possibility of a two-state solution, and that we remain committed to negotiating a Palestinian state, if that becomes possible from a perspective of Israeli security. At the very least, we were committed to not taking any step that would make a Palestinian state impossible to implement. If we begin annexing parts of the, mid of, of the West Bank, we will be on a slippery slope toward the end of the possibility of a two-state solution and bringing us instead toward a disastrous one state by national solution. When I think of a binational Palestinian Israeli state, the image that comes to mind, the model that comes to mind is Yugoslavia. We all know how that ended up, or Syria, or Lebanon, or Iraq. These are failed states. And I understand the fears of the Israeli right regarding a Palestinian state, I share those fears. I don't trust the Palestinian leadership. I don't trust the peaceful intentions of the Palestinian national movement. Nevertheless, I believe that the only thing worse than a two-state solution is a one-state solution, which is no solution at all. And so if we implement annexation, even in part of the territory, even just in a few settlements, we are beginning a process that could end with the destruction of the alternative ability of freeing ourselves from the model of Yugoslavia or Lebanon. The, um, this is a moment of complicated hope in terms of our relations with the Middle East, with the Arab world. In the last few years, we have seen the tentative but growing development of an unprecedented security relationship between Israel and the Sunni Arab world, especially Saudi Arabia and the Gulf states. Now, until a few years ago, Saudi Arabia was Israel's greatest enemy in the Arab world. There was no country that was more anti-Semitic than Saudi Arabia. Today, the Saudi media is urging a reconciliation with Israel. And I'll give you an example from my own personal experience. I recently published a book called Letters to My Palestinian Neighbor, which is a series of letters that I've written to Palestinians, to the Arab world, and to anyone else who is interested in uh, eavesdropping on our conversation uh, that explains uh, this conflict through an Israeli perspective. 
And the book appeared in English and was also translated into Arabic. And I offered it for free downloading in Arabic. And thousands of people throughout the Middle East have downloaded, have read, have responded to the book. And not long ago, one of Saudi Arabia's leading news magazines published a two-page favorable review of my book. Now, this has never happened in the history of the Arab-Israeli conflict, where a book that explains Zionism and explains the Israeli position would be favorably reviewed in an Arab publication, let alone a Saudi publication. And so we are potentially at a new moment in the history of Arab-Israeli relations. And I say that against as the backdrop for feeling a sense of urgency to try to stop annexation. Because my fear is that among the many negative consequences of annexation, harming Israel's relations with the Arab world will be at the top of that list. So again, my deep hope is that annexation will not happen, that our own self-interest will prevail and that we will be we will save ourselves from the potentially disastrous consequences of what is really a self-inflicted disaster. The last point that I'll make is that this, this is a moment where it's very hard to find hope in the relations between Israel and the Palestinians. Uh, where, from where I'm sitting right now in my home at the edge of Jerusalem, I'm looking out, I'm looking at the West Bank, literally on the next hill from where I sit, and we are divided by a wall, a concrete security wall that Israel built to keep suicide bombers from crossing into sovereign Israeli territory. But that wall is not only a physical wall, it's also a metaphorical wall for all that separates me as an Israeli from my Palestinian neighbors. The wall of hatred, of suspicion, mutual suspicion, mutual hatred, mutual fear. My hope is that the corona experience, which has crossed borders, it's happening on the Palestinian side, just as it's happening on this side of the wall. That corona will be a reminder of our shared humanity, of the futility of pretending that we can create completely hermetically sealed spaces away from our neighbor, and will help us reach a point where despite all of the justified fear that both sides have toward each other, and both sides have earned that fear and mistrust of the other, that nevertheless, this moment could become a, a, a turning point where we will begin to realize that there is no alternative but to try to figure out a way in which we can live together as neighbors rather than continuing a war that has already lasted uh, for 100 years. Thank you very much for listening. And I look so much forward to coming to Poland uh, and uh, coming to the festival in person. Thank you and good morning.